Good morning, ladies. So welcome to your last week here of school. So these last two stories are all uh, biographies. So here for your resources section for uh, what is a biography? A biography is a text that is written to inform the reader about a person's real life. The person the biography is written about can be alive or deceased. So some characteristics of biography. The author is someone other than the person being featured in the biography includes important events from the person's life, and the author can use narration to share snippets of the person's life. Why do authors write biographies? Authors write biographies to inform their readers. So again, if we're talking about author's purpose, the purpose of a biography is to inform. Authors believe the person they wrote the biography about is important or made a contribution to other people that other people need to know about, okay? Um, so then again, we have some other resources here. Um, I'm going to go through now the tips for analyzing real people and biographies. So these are some questions that you can ask, things you can kind of check in with yourself as you're reading a story. Um, why do people care about this person? Why did they achieve? What did they achieve, create, inspire, or remove that impacted others? What was going on in the world during the time this person lived? If the person is living, focus on that person that is currently living. Think about what is going on there that would support that person or provide adversity. Is the person famous for something positive or infamous for something negative? Why would someone want to know more about this person? What makes he or she unique? Um, another thing you can do is to form your own opinion about the person based on the information provided. Would you look up to this person? Why or why not? If you met this person, what would you ask him or her? Compare and contrast. Think about other historical figures or people you know and classify any similarities or differences you can make. Think about their words, thoughts, and actions and identify connections, whether supporting or opposing. So our first story that we're going to be reading today is all about Frederick Douglass. So I'm just going to scooch down and take a look at our uh, two first prompts. So for Monday, for pages 4 through 10, your prompt is, why did Frederick have a reputation of being both a leader and a troublemaker? Okay, so make sure you're addressing both parts of those prompt. And then on Tuesday, for pages 11 to 15, why did the author choose to write a biography on Frederick Douglass? What can we learn from his story? Okay, so again, we learned in our little tips and tricks for identifying and analyzing biographies that the author's purpose is to definitely inform. So I want you to kind of build on that uh, when you're doing your prompt for Tuesday to make it your own. All right, so now let's get into the story. Frederick Douglass, Forever Free. bread for lessons. Eight-year-old Frederick Douglass grabbed a loaf of bread from the kitchen and slipped out of the back door to run errands. Frederick was a slave, but he was allowed to take as much bread as he liked. He knew he had more to eat than some boys in his neighborhood, so, see, so he took food to trade with them. While he had plenty of bread, the other boys had something he wanted even more. They knew how to write. As Frederick walked down the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, he thought about how unjust it was that he wasn't allowed to read. Just the day before, his owner's wife, Mrs. Sophia Ald, had snatched a newspaper away from him as he tried to read it in secret. All Frederick wanted was an education, but that wasn't allowed for slaves in the 1820s. In fact, it was against the law. That's why Frederick made his friend, made friends with the poor white boys in the city. They had been allowed to attend school. First, he teased them, saying, I bet I know more of the alphabet than you do. He'd write a few letters in the dirt, and the other boys would write what they knew. <clears throat> and Frederick would learn to write the new letters. Now he was bartering food for proper lessons in reading and writing. Up ahead, Frederick saw one of his friends waiting to give him a lesson and hurry to join him. Frederick would give up his lunch every day to learn. Born a slave. Frederick was born in February of 1817 or 1818. He never knew the date of his birthday. And though he knew his father was white, he never knew who he was. His mother was Harriet Bailey, but Frederick was raised by his grandmother, Betsy Bailey. When he was eight years old, Frederick was sent to work in a as a houseboy for some of his owner's relatives, the Ald family in Baltimore, Maryland. When Frederick first came to the Ald, Sophia Ald helped teach him the alphabet. She gave him several lessons before her husband forbade her. Education and slavery were incompatible, he said. A slave who learned to read will become dissatisfied with his condition and desire freedom. 
This proved to be true. The more books and newspapers Frederick read, the clearer his own thoughts about slavery became. The more he despised slavery and the more dejected he was. For some time, Frederick struggled to comprehend the word abolition. Whenever a slave ran away or did something a slave owner disliked, abolition was blamed. Frederick tried looking up the word in a dictionary, but it merely said the act of abolishing. What was being abolished? In 1831, Frederick read an article about the abolition movement and the people who were striving to end slavery. Now he understood. Some white people wanted to abolish slavery too. He also learned that blacks were free in some states and he began dreaming of escape. Once you learn to read, Douglas wrote later in life, you will forever be free. Understanding that education and freedom went hand in hand, he began giving lessons to other slaves until slaveholders stopped his Sunday school. He earned a reputation among slaves as a leader and among slave owners as a troublemaker. Escape. For years, Frederick had lived the easier life of a slave in the city. At 15, he was sent to work on a farm as a field hand for Edward, Edward Colby, a brutal man known as a slave breaker. Colby would beat slaves into obedience. Loaning Frederick to Covey may have been Ald's way of punishing Frederick for trying to educate other slaves as well as himself. Covey almost succeeded in breaking his spirit. After enduring six months of abuse, though, 16-year-old Frederick fought back. <clears throat> Later he wrote, We were at it for nearly two hours. Covey at length let me go, puffing and blowing at a great rate, saying that if I had not resisted, he would not have whipped me half as much. The truth was, that he had not whipped me at all. After their confrontation, Colby never tried to beat him again, but Frederick began to plan his escape in earnest. He tried once and was caught. Still, Frederick continued to dream of freedom and worked on his literacy, even joining the East Baltimore Mental Improvement Society, a debate club. It was there that Frederick met Anna Murray, a free black woman. <clears throat> Together, Anna and Frederick planned his escape. Dressed in a sailor's uniform and carrying a freedom's free man's passport, Frederick traveled through Delaware and Pennsylvania to New York. He escaped. The escape took a little less than 24 hours. But as Frederick later wrote, I lived more in one day than in a year of my slave life. Speaking to audiences years later, Frederick would say, I appear for you before you this evening as a thief and a robber. I stole this head. This, these limbs, this body from my master, and ran off with them. Escaping didn't mean that a slave like Frederick was truly free. Slaves who made it to a free state could live as if they were free, but they could still be seized and taken back to a slave state. Frederick sent for Anna to join him, and they were married in 1838. Since Frederick was a fugitive who could be caught and forced back into slavery, they took a new name, Douglas. The newlywed Mr. and Mrs. Douglas settled in New York, New Bedford, excuse me, Massachusetts, and had five children together. A railroad for runaways. Abolitionists organized a secret network to help fugitive slaves in the 1800s. This network came to be called the Underground Railroad. Places with food, clothing, and shelter were called safe houses or stations because many fugitives traveled on foot. People helping the slaves, known as conductors or station masters, tried to provide a station every 15 miles. Frederick Douglass stayed in safe houses when he first escaped. He himself later became a station master in Rochester, New York, helping some slaves escape to Canada. So at this point in time, ladies, if you want to pause the video, um, this is our first pausing point for our first prompt, and now we'll continue for Tuesday. <coughs> Excuse me. Writing and speaking. Douglas began to speak at anti-slavery meetings. With his first-hand account of life as a slave and his bold escape, he became the voice of the abolition movement. His very existence countered the slaveholders' argument that slaves lacked the intellect to function as free American citizens. Yet Douglas was so articulate that some whites refused to believe that he had ever been a slave. Douglas wrote the first of three autobiographies, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. When it was published in 1845, critics charged the book like Douglas, was fake. No slave could write so eloquently, they argued. Yet the book was an instant success and persuaded many people that a slave could, have, could possess a great mind. 
At the same time, the book included details that could have led to Douglas's arrest as a fugitive slave. In order to avoid capture, Douglas went abroad for two years on a speaking tour in Ireland and England. An electrifying speaker, Douglas was a star overseas, and fans there raised $711 for Douglas's freedom, a purchase called Manumission. When Douglas returned to the United States in 1848, he founded a newspaper. He also penned thousands of speeches and editorials calling for social justice. I expose slavery in this country, wrote Douglas, because it expo to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. One of his most famous speeches was, What to the slave is the 4th of July? <clears throat> When he delivered that speech on July 5, 1852, Douglas surprised his audience by posing questions about what Independence Day meant for slaves and former slaves. What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us? land of the free. By the Civil War, Douglas was the most admired African American in the United States. In 1863, he served as President Lincoln's advisor during the drafting of the Emancipation Proclamation, an order, an order that freed the majority of the slaves. Yet the abolition of slavery wasn't stated, wasn't a stated goal of the war, though Douglas repeatedly urged Lincoln to make it one. Some historians think Douglas helped inspire the renowned Gettysburg Address, address Act and a Lincoln inaugural address. Douglas also convinced Lincoln to allow black soldiers to fight for the North. The Union Army's 54th Massachusetts Regiment was the first to be comp comprised of black soldiers, including two of Douglas's sons. Douglas and President Lincoln. Lincoln and Douglas didn't always see eye to eye. After Lincoln died though, Douglas gave the keynote address at a memorial honoring him. The crowd gave Douglas a standing ovation and the president's widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, gave him Lincoln's favorite walking stick in appreciation. The walking stick still rests in Douglas's house. Douglas's writing and speaking helped end slavery with the 13th Amendment, passed after the Civil War ended in 1865. Three years later, the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to former slaves, and shortly after that, in 1870, the 15th Amendment granted every male citizen, including former slaves, the right to vote. For the rest of his life, Douglas continued to promote equality for all Americans. He wanted the United States to reach its potential as a land of the free for blacks, women, Native Americans, and immigrants, too. I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong, Douglas said. Douglas and women's rights. Douglas didn't live to see universal suffrage, the right of every adult to vote, but he fought for it until he died. Eventually, in 1920, the states ratified the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. Douglas remained married to Anna for 44 years, until she passed away in 1882. Two years later, he married Helen Pitts, an advocate for civil rights. Their marriage caused controversy since Pitts was a white woman. But Douglas sought to live in a world where race didn't matter. He died February 20th, 1895. Today, Douglas is often referred to as the father of the civil rights movement. Seventy years after his death, at the height of that movement, the United States Postal Service honored him with his own 1965 postage stamp. He changed the way the country thought about slavery and race, and he left behind words to continue to inspire Americans, including his newspaper motto, rights of no sex, truth of no color. Oh, that was it. Right is, right is of no sex, truth is of no color. All right, lady. So over here, again, you can see that you have uh, your glossary. You probably recognize a lot of these words, but these are bold-faced words that you came across in the story. So I hope that you enjoyed. And now we're going to go on to Cesar Chavez. So before we get into our reading, let's preview our prompt. So for Wednesday, pages 4 through 12, your prompt is what series of events is in C I'm sorry, typo there, in Cesar Chavez's life lead um, to him getting involved in activism. So what events took place um, in his childhood that got him involved in activism? Sorry about that typo there. Is should be in. Thursday, pages seven, uh, 13 to 24, the prompt is, why did the author choose to write a biography about Cesar Chavez? What can we learn from his story? And then the 
final one. So you're going to be finishing the story on Thursday. And then for Friday, um, you're going to reread both of the texts to compare and contrast. And your prompt is what trait do Frederick Douglass and Cesar Chavez share? And be sure to support your responses. So again, another familiar man here, you know, jumps back to Esperanza Rising when we did our little study on him. Um, so let's read about the life of Cesar Chavez. Introduction. Introduction. Cesar Chavez was one of the most famous labor leaders in the world. Today, more than a decade after his death, he continues to be one of the most revered and best loved Hispanic figures in the history of the United States. He was a poor farm worker with little formal education, but against great odds, he founded and successfully organized a labor union for farm workers. A union is a group of workers who gather their power together to fight against low wages and dangerous working conditions. Cesar was absolutely dedicated to nonviolence and used many creative tactics in his organizing, such as boycotts, fast marches, and civil disobedience. Although he worked tirelessly to improve wages and working conditions for farm workers, Caesar never earned more than $6,000 per year. Through his example of fighting courageously for the dignity of all people, he inspired millions of Americans to work for social justice for poor people around the world. He was a humble and spiritual man who dedicated his life to helping others. He was a true American hero. This is his story. A humbling beginning. Cesar Estrada Chavez was born on March 31st, 1927, near Yuma, Arizona. When Cesar was five years old, his family moved to a small farm that had belonged to his grandfather. Cesar's memories of that farm were filled with the love of his family and the security of being part of a stable community. He and his younger brother, Richard, were inseparable. And although they had to do chores around the farm, they also had time to play and explore the Arizona landscape. Caesar loved reading and learning, but his early experiences with school were not positive. Caesar's family spoke only Spanish at home, but at school, Caesar was punished with a smack of a ruler across his knuckles if he used his native language. At school, he was discriminated against for being Mexican-American and was hurt and angry at being treated like a second-class citizen. Caesar's mother, Juana, a devout Catholic, was a firm believer in nonviolence. She insisted that Caesar never react violently to injustice he witnessed and experienced. Big changes. Life for the Chavez family changed abruptly in 1937. Through a series of bad deals by one of their neighbors, the Chavez family lost their farm. They joined many other poor families who traveled west during the Great Depression looking for jobs as migrant farm workers. Life on the farm is very difficult from life on their farm in Arizona. Excuse, excuse me, life on the road was very different from their life on the farm in Arizona. Most farms in California were owned by corporations or wealthy growers who wanted cheap labor in order to keep profits high. The provided camp, they provided camps for the workers to live, and but many families crowded into tiny shacks while others lived in tents along riverbanks or under bridges. Besides being Hard work for low pay, farm labor was also dangerous. Farm machine accidents and exposure to insect and weed killing chemicals resulted in injury, illness, and even death. Basic necessities such as toilets and fresh water often were not provided. With so many people looking for work, it was difficult to find jobs and money was scarce. Even though farm workers harvested tons of fruit and vegetables, many did not earn enough to buy food for themselves. Although the Chavez family was also struggling, Caesar's mother often shared their food with others who were less fortunate. Caesar didn't understand this. Why would his mother give away little food they had worked so hard to just get? But Iwana also, excuse me, always insisted that service to others was more important than satisfying one's own needs. Tough times. For several years, the Chavez family moved around California, finding work whether, wherever they could. By the time Caesar graduated from the eighth grade, he had gone to more than 30 schools. He was often teased because he didn't have decent clothes or shoes and because he spoke English with an accent. Caesar and his siblings did odd jobs after school and worked in the fields with their parents on weekends during the summer. Working in the fields was drudgery. Caesar hated that his family had to work for someone else rather than for themselves. He felt closed in by the crowded barrios and labor camps and he painfully missed the freedom of the family farm. But the worst part about being a migrant worker was the fact that workers were often cheated out of their already meager pay. Labor contractors promised to work when there was none or kept workers' wages until they, were, until they completed a dangerous job. 
One time the whole family worked at a vineyard for seven weeks, seven days a week, and at the end of the harvest they found the contractor had left without paying them. There was nothing they could do. Many times the whole family walked away from the jobs when they felt that they were treated, being treated unfairly. Dignity was more important than money that they would earn. At age 15, Caesar left and worked in the fields full-time to help support his family. He left school. Two years later, during World War II, he joined the U.S. Navy, hoping to get away from the life of a migrant worker. Even though he never fought in combat, he didn't enjoy the military. He returned to California when his tour of duty ended. He married Helen Fabia Fabella, and they had eight children. They dreamed of sending their children to college so they might have an easier life than Caesar had. The family moved to San Jose, California, to be closer to Caesar's brother, Richard, settling into a barrio known as Sal C. Puedes. Get out of it. Get out if you can. The beginning of activism. In Sal C. Puedes, Caesar often drove Father Donald McDonnell, a Catholic priest, to and from the labor camps to stay in mass for the workers. On their long drives, they would talk about farm workers. While Caesar knew a lot about the actual work, he knew very little about the economics behind labor, which Father McDonald explained. Father McDonald also gave Caesar many books on social injustice, including a biography of Mahatmas K. Gandhi. Gandhi led the nation of India to independence from British um, colonial rule entirely through nonviolent means. He organized millions of Indians into a peaceful yet powerful economic and political force. What stood out to Caesar was the fact that rather than giving orders, Gandhi led by example, staging protests, hunger strikes, and civil disobedience. Eventually, Caesar heard a group of a group called Community Service Organization, CSO. The CSO worked in the urban areas in California, helping poor people register to vote, get access to health care, and fight police brutality and racial discrimination. Caesar met a man named Fred Ross and accompanied him to CSO meetings. He watched the way Fred helped people through the grassroots organizing. Fred was a great motivator who inspired people to stand up for themselves. Before long, Caesar was working for the CSO full time. And after 10 years, he rose to become its national director. So this is the time to pause. This is our first pausing point in the story for prompt, if you want to pause the video. Um, but we will continue for Thursdays. Caesar wanted to do more. He proposed the C CSO. He proposed that the CSO organize a labor union for farm workers. The idea was supported by Dolores Huerta, another young activist. The CSO was so opposed to the idea, they thought unions were controversial and dangerous. When the proposal came up for a vote, it was defeated. After the vote, Caesar stood up and announced that he was resigning. As national director, two weeks later, on his 35th birthday, Caesar left the CSO, CFO and CSO, excuse me, in order to start a union for farm workers. Si se puede. The birth of a union. A labor union is a group of workers who organize together, pooling their money and power. Unions are much stronger than individual workers, and as a group, unionized workers can demand certain rights and benefits. If a union is dissatisfied with a job, it can go on strike, refusing to work and shutting down the industry until it demands its demands are met. Many factories, mills, mines, and docks had been unionized in the 1930s, resulting in higher wages, safer working conditions, and other benefits such as medical insurance. But many people considered organizing a labor union for farm workers to be impossible. Farm workers moved around following the crops, not staying in one place long enough to plan action. Also, there were often recent immigrants who did not speak English well and were afraid to make trouble for themselves. Finally, unlike industrial workers, farm workers had no laws protecting them from being fired if they tried to organize. For farm workers who lived in labor camps, being fired meant not only losing their jobs, but also losing their homes. Caesar knew a union could make big improvements in the lives of farm workers, but he believed that even though others had failed, si se puede, it could be done. Caesar and Helen moved to Helen's hometown of Delano, California, where her family could help care for the children. Helen's support of Caesar's work and goals was crucial to Caesar since he would not have an income. Caesar began driving up and down the fertile San Joaquin Valley 
in an old beat up station wagon. He met with farm workers in their homes and talked with them about their problems. His plan was to build the union slowly, one worker at a time. He felt very strongly that the union must belong to the workers, not to outside organizations. Caesar was small and soft-spoken, but he was very persuasive. Soon others, like Dolores Huerta from the CSO, joined his efforts, although none of them, including Caesar, were paid. Many times Caesar didn't know how they would buy gas or food, but somehow things worked out. Often the farm workers fed Caesar and the other organizers when they came to their homes. Huelga! Remember what that means? Anybody? From Esperanza Rising, remember Huelga means strike. strike. The Delano Grape Strike. In 1865, a group of Filipino farm workers went on strike against the Delano area grape growers. They were asking for a pay raise. Oops, too far. Sorry. They were asking for a pay raise of $1.40 an hour. Pay raise to $1.40 an hour, excuse me. Caesar had hoped for another two or three years of organizing before calling a big strike, but he knew he had to support the Filipino strikers. One week later, 1,200 member families of Caesar's National Farm Workers Association, NFWA, voted to join the strike. All of the laborers stopped working, even though there was only $82 in the union treasury to support them. Wow. Workers set up picket lines in the fields, proudly waving their homemade union flags, which were red with a black eagle in the center. Support for the strike was strong, but Caesar knew that it would, per would be a tense situation. Right from the start, he insisted that the union members never use violence. Caesar also understood that in order for the strike to succeed, it was important to get support from the outside, outside of the Delano area. Strikers and their families went to cities all across North America, telling people about the working conditions of the grape pickers and asking them not to buy grapes. The boycott would take business away from the growers until they were willing to sign a union contract. During the long struggle, Caesar worked tirelessly, and like Gandhi, he led by example. His deep religious faith helped him, helped him through many tough times. Angry grape growers made threats on Caesar's life. He also faced challenges from within the union. At one point, some of the farm workers became discouraged and wanted to resort to violence. If the grape growers wouldn't listen and the police kept trying to break up the picket lines, why shouldn't the workers fight back? Caesar had to make the workers stop and think about what they were suggesting. He went on a water-only fast that lasted 25 days. Those who still wanted to use violence would have to face the consequences of allowing Caesar to starve. The fast had tremendous impact. People worried that Caesar would damage his health. When they saw him making a huge sacrifice, it made them think about what they were doing. Caesar's fast re-energized the farm workers and put an end to the talk of violence. Just the beginning. Support for the boycott continued, and after five long years, the Delano grape growers agreed to the union's demands. Against all, all odds, Caesar's efforts had succeeded. As sweet as it was, it was only the beginning. For Caesar, working to improve the lives of, lives of farm workers was a lifelong endeavor. He often said, the rich have money, but the poor have time. The rest of his, for the rest of his life, Caesar continued to work on behalf of the farm workers. In 1972, Caesar's union chose a new name, the Union Farm Workers of America, UFW. Membership grew to 80,000, and the union expanded to other crops besides grapes. There were other strikes and boycotts, many of which received great support from the American public. At one point, a poll showed that 17 million Americans supported the UFW. In 1975, California finally passed a law that protected farm workers from being fired when they tried to organize. There were also tough times. There were, though the UFW remained nonviolent, strikers were often victims of violence. Between 1972 and 1983, four farm workers and one supporter were killed. Caesar also undertook two more fasts. The last one, which ended after 36 days in August 8, 1988, called attention to the harm that pesticides caused farm workers and their children. Caesar's legacy. Caesar Chavez died peacefully in his sleep on April 23, 1993. He was 66 years old. Young. 
Over 50,000 farm workers and UFW supporters came to his funeral in Delano to honor the courageous and humble man who worked so hard for dignity for all people. It was the largest funeral for any labor leader in the history of the United States. In 1991, Caesar received the Aguila Azteca, Aztec Eagle, Mexico's highest award for people of Mexican heritage who have made contributions outside of Mexico. On August 8, 1994, Caesar became the second Mexican-American to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civil civilian honor in the United States. President Bill Clinton presented this award to Caesar's widow, Helen. On August 18, 2000, the state of California officially made March 31st Caesar Chavez Day of Service and Learning. On this special day, School children across the state perform service for communities in California in honor of the life and work of Cesar Chavez. So this was kind of a cool extra thing that they had um, here to kind of explore more if you wanted to really dive in and learn more about Cesar Chavez and really add to your knowledge. That was kind of a cool thing that was included in here. And then again, you have your glossaries at the end. I love you so much, ladies. So, so much. Please make sure you come visit.